This video is brought to you by Skillshare, the online learning community for creatives. The first 500 people to use the link in the description below will receive a free one month trial. So check them out and thanks Skillshare. There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Or is there? Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and I will just cut to the chase. Chinese lens manufacturer Taipok, a company new to me, so that's how I'm pronouncing it, is nothing if not smart, ambitious, and looking to break out from the rest of the pack. And it has done so with this lens, beginning with the thing that got me to, yes, I'll take a look, in the first place. Their use of the 1968 Alpacurn Sweetar 50mm f1.9 macro as essentially the design brief for it. We are talking about lifting the external design close to whole cloth from the Alpa's focus ring design and location nearest the camera body to its unusual depth of field indicator. That was the most intriguing to me of all. And both a narrowing between f-stops as one closes down along with a decreasing number of intermediate aperture detents moving in one-third stop increments from wide open to f4, half stop increments from there to f8, and full stop increments thereafter to f16. Which doesn't really do anything for me. It's neither here nor there, but okay, simply for this homage, bravo, Taipok. The build quality of the lens is very solid. I'd say the best among all the manual focus M-mount lenses I've had in hand from any of the new Chinese companies. The only caveat being that the metal lens hood and lens hood cover were looser on the particular lens I received than I'd like, and the holes used for the depth of field indicator quite likely will only make bad weather more of an issue. Other than that, however, the lenses fit, finish, and both the weighting and smoothness of the focus and aperture rings are really quite nice, even if I'd prefer a Sumalux style focusing tab to the Samara's Infinity Focus Lock. To the company's additional credit, however, the Samara is not simply a clone of the Sweetar. The Samara's optical formula and materials are more modern without being overly complex, and it sports a 14 bladed aperture. Kudos to Taipok again, although I've seen wonderfully rendered background blur with fewer than 14 blades, so I'm not sure what the value of that number is, really. But forget all of that, because the big question is this. How good is it optically? Pretty decent, especially for a first outing. More than decent. One, here in the Batcave, near minimum focus distance testing revealed that Voigtlander's more expensive and slower larger yet lighter Apolanthar 35mm f2 outpointed the Samara in every category from resolution and chromatic aberration to vignetting, flare, and distortion, but not by much. Which is quite a feat, really, since the Apolanthar is one heck of a lens and why I own one. But two, out on the streets of New York, this time mounted to my Leica SL3 for even faster, surer focusing using the high-resolution EVF and having IBIS to allow me to shoot at lower shutter speeds and therefore closer to base ISO for greater dynamic range, I found the Typox image quality, without pixel peeping, to be a bit more of a mixed bag. It was certainly sharp enough for classic street or environmental street portrait work even wide open. And at f8, which is where I'd most often shoot for zone focusing, I noticed neither ghosting nor flare, although to be fair, this is due at least in part to the fact that I instinctively shoot to avoid those things anyway. Still, A. In the real world, 
contrast of the Taipok straight out of camera, wide open, was lower than I'd like. B. Distortion was more of an issue than I'd anticipated from a 35, ranging from minor to, whoa, what was that at frame's edge? And C. I just didn't have the visceral, yeah, baby, yeah, reaction to the lens that I do with my other 35s, although those are really good 35s and more expensive. None of which prevented me from getting a number of shots I quite like, actually, although it took more work in post than usual to get them to where they needed to be. And sometimes the only way to fix something was to crop in heavily from the sides, which is pretty much a perfect segue to talk to you about editing in 2024, courtesy of today's sponsor, Skillshare. For me, the thing that really separates Skillshare from other ways of learning beyond that it is a community specifically for creatives, enthusiasts and professionals alike, is that it is structured, both to allow students to proceed at his or her own pace and to leverage class instruction from excellent teachers with the perspectives and work of those students, that is, the other members of the class. This is really cool. I think of it as a virtuous cycle, a feedback loop that both inspires and accelerates one's learning. As someone who teaches street photography IRL in real life myself, this is something I really appreciate and respect. Which is why it's easy for me to recommend two courses in particular to give you a jump start on your editing in 2024. Learning about the latest improvements in Adobe's Masking and Lightroom Creative Cloud, which are phenomenal, courtesy of Martin Van Wiegels, Quick and Accurate Masking in Lightroom CC. This is Creative Cloud and the introduction of generative AI to Adobe Photoshop, beginning with Jonathan Parker's Mastering Adobe's Generative Film. These editing advances have allowed me to make small, but never before possible for me changes in my images that have made an outsized impact upon my satisfaction with them. But I don't just recommend Skillshare. I use it myself. Although these days, not for photography. I think I've got that pretty well covered. Instead, I've figured out that I need to get out of my own head by doing something very different and very positive. And I've decided this means spending a bit of my spare time outside of photography with my other passion since childhood, which is music. I have to say that Skillshare made it easy to find a class that I like, and I've just started Mike Barnes' GarageBand iOS for iPhone and iPad. I appreciate his knowledge, approach, and personality. I really like the digestibly sized lessons. And I'm impressed with the way other members of the class are encouraged to share their work as a means both of overcoming one's own fears and encouraging others to go for it. So do check them out. The first 500 people to use my link in the description below will receive a one month free trial of Skillshare. So I say, give it a go and let me know how it goes for you. Thank you, Skillshare, for sponsoring this video. Anyway, the bottom line on the Taipok is this. There isn't such a thing as a free lunch. And if you don't truly need to shoot at 1.4 regularly, and you can scrape up the extra $250 for a new one, only an extra $100 for a used one, I'd recommend the nominally one-stop slower Apo Lanthar over the Taipok. It's a better lens across the board, and you have to ask yourself, why would I allow a couple of hundred bucks to get in the way of a superior lens? If budget is tight, that's why. But especially if you are uncomfortable with cropping and tend to fill the entire frame with detail because of the edge distortion I mentioned earlier, yeah, I'd go to the Apo Lanthar. I'd also recommend the Voigtlander over the Taipok in particular if your plan is to use it on just about any modern digital camera other than a Leica M. Because what the Voigtlander has that the Taipok doesn't is electronic communication. That is the transmission of EXIF data between the camera and lens, which is great in real time for helping to optimize in-body image stabilization performance, great after the fact when searching for specific images or assessing what lenses at what apertures you use most often. I found this kind of thing to be very helpful in buying decisions. Neither of which, unfortunately, matters if you shoot with a Leica M because Leica M doesn't use electrical contacts. 
If, however, you do absolutely most of the time need a manual focus only 35 1.4, okay, it's easy to recommend the Samara. I think the larger issue, what is clear to me in any case, is that the farther away one is from a state-of-the-art high-resolution digital camera to use with the Samara, the less data-driven one is, or the more likely one is to prioritize character over clinical details, the more likely one is to embrace the Samara and find it, yeah, compelling. If you're shooting with a film M or a 10.3 megapixel M8, which I own for years, for example, I'd say there's little reason to spend the extra money on the Voigtlander because it is unlikely you'll be able to see the difference in all but the most extreme circumstances and maybe not even then, especially if all you're doing is posting to Instagram. This is because the resolving power of digital sensors compared to film, say 35mm Tri-X or Ilford HP5, cross the resolution parity Rubicon at about 12 megapixels more than a decade ago. On the other hand, if you've dropped 8 large for an M11 because you actually want to use all of those 60 megapixels and have no problem spending that much money on top of that for a single lens, forget about the lenses I've already mentioned, forget about 1.4, and spend $8,300 instead on Leica's Aposumicron M 35mm f2 because you will find significant, holy differences especially if you envision printing your images at mural sizes and inviting viewers to peruse them at closer than normal viewing distances. Okay, fine, save three grand and do get like a Sumilux M35 1.4 FLE because you'll still see the difference between it and the Samara. Save even more if you get one used. But then there's this. Image quality is not only a function of lens performance and sensor resolution, but focus accuracy. You know this. And today, the best properly used autofocus systems are better than the best manual focus practitioners across the broadest array of use cases. That's just a fact. If you're already using a modern autofocus camera, but are budget constrained, fair enough. Think Nikon's $2,000 ZF Panasonic's $1,800 Lumix S5 II or Sony's $1,500 A7 III, even less if you get them used. And think manual focus would be cool if you love the idea of small and light and you are really good at manual focusing at f1.4. I tell you, okay, fine, sure, whatever floats your boat, the Samara will work for you. The Voigtlander still might work better for you, but clinically speaking, you'd be better off dropping 700 bucks on a used autofocusing Nikkor Z35 1.8 $600 on a new autofocusing Lumix 35 1.8S, or if you really want, $1.4, $800 on Sigma's autofocusing 35 1.4 DGDN Art, $650 on either Sony's FE 35 1.8 or Sigma's 35 F2, also available in L mount for the S5 II, even just $300 on a Nikkor Z 40mm F2, which is a great little lens. Not only are you likely, all else being equal, to extract more from the sensor more often, but a, you'll have the EXIF data to help the camera better calibrate its IBIS and help you better understand what you shoot and how you shoot it that the TIPOC or any other manual focus lens I've already mentioned except for some Voigtlanders cannot provide. And B, you'll most likely have better dust and moisture resistance too. But hey, that's just me. Your mileage may vary, and as always, that's fine. Although. There is one other thing I was just about to forget to mention that is critical for those of us with an early Leica M3 or any M5, although I now share this with you not from my personal experience, but instead from our friend and fellow YouTuber Bobby Tonelli. And that is that there may be physical clearance issues between the Samara and early versions of the M3, courtesy of the locking knob, as I understand it, at an infinity focus on the one hand, and a Leica M5 on the other hand, which by virtue of a CDS metering cell mounted on a carrier arm that swings in front of the film plane between shots, and the depth of the Samara's rear element may hinder proper operation of the camera. I'd love to know what you guys think, but by the way, this is not unique to Samara. In any event, I think the Samara is a very credible first effort, and I suspect Tipoc is here to stay. I look forward to seeing what they do next. This video was brought to you by Skillshare, the online learning community for creatives. The first 500 people to use the link in the description below will receive a free one month trial. So check them out 
And thanks, Skillshare. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, join the conversation in the comment section below because this is an exceptional audience. If you'd like help with a portfolio review, gear selection, finding or honing your artistic voice, sign up for a one-on-one -on -one mentoring video call via Zoom at 3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, please consider supporting our work by using the no cost you affiliate links down below, sending us coffee money via PayPal, or most especially joining us on Patreon links down below as well. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.